Open our spiritual hearts, our spiritual eyes, Lord Jesus. Give us understanding, Lord Jesus. We ask you, Lord, for the gifts of the Spirit here tonight, Lord. We thank you, we praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Let's just lift our hands and just worship him. Amen. He's worthy of our praise. He's worthy. He is worthy of our praise. Of his, he's worthy of our praise. Hallelujah. 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 Yes, God, you're worthy of our praise. Oh, we thank you, Lord. We thank you, God. Hey, Jesus, 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 thank you for your presence. Lord God, we thank you and we praise you tonight, Father. You are the El Shaddai. Hallelujah. You are El El Donai. Hallelujah. You are El Elyon, O God. You're Jehovah Jireh, our provider. Hallelujah, Lord. You're faithful every day, God. Your mercies are new every morning, God. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, we give you praise in the house, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. We give you glory, we give you glory, we give you glory. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, 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 amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. We live in a wicked world. I want to make sure my phone's off so it doesn't go ringing. I want to welcome those who are watching by Facebook Good tonight. God bless you. Good to have you with us. Thank God his word is anointed all the time. Thank God you can pick this book up anytime and hear God speak to you. Amen. It's God's word, and he speaks through his word to us. Hallelujah. Amen. We're living in a time where it seems like evil is prevailing. But I know that God is still in control of everything. You know, when you hear of the violence and the things that are going on, we kind of get sheltered as a Christian. We kind of get sheltered in our own little cocoons, you know. We kind of have our own little, I hate to use the terminology, safe space, because <laughs> that means something totally different today. But we have our little safe places that we kind of like, uh, kind of get comfortable in, and we kind of stay in that place, and we... Um, we kind of shut things out. But when you begin to get out there and you begin to get involved with people's lives and you begin to uh, intertwine with people, and, you know, you guys, you have work, you go to work, and you deal with unsafe people all the time. And uh, sometimes it can get frustrating. Sometimes it can get aggravating. But the real enemy behind the person, the real one that's trying to get at you is demonic, it's spiritual, it's wickedness in high places. It's those demon spirits that are trying to um, bring you to the place where you will turn your back on the things of God and you will uh, blow your testimony. 
in Romans chapter 16, verse 20, it says, And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. I just wanted to just touch on this for a moment and then get into something else. But during this time, understand that the Christians, the Jewish Christians, the Gentile Christians were under Roman tyranny. They were under the Roman Empire. And what Paul was saying here is that the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly, meaning that he was going to bring an end to the Roman Empire. Because the Roman Empire is what exactly what Satan was using to suppress God's people. He uses governments, the enemy takes these governments, and he uses them to suppress God's people. We see it all over the place. If you've been reading the, if you've been reading the news and listening to the news, you hear about Christians that are being martyred every single day. Their heads are being cut off. They're, you know, they're uh, uh, in prison. We just had another one released from Turkey that was in prison for two years, um, you know, with false accusations against them. Uh, so we see that in America we're we're protected. We don't we don't have persecution in the same sense as other people in other parts of the world. Like in China, you can't have a Bible. In mainland China, you can't own a Bible. If you own a Bible and you stop preaching from that Bible, you go to prison. People, are, their rights are violated. Their democracy is not a democracy. It's a dictatorship. And what ends up happening is, is that the enemy gets a hold of these government leaders and he maneuvers them into position to bring suppression and oppression. And here in this verse, God's telling the Roman believers that he's going to bruise Satan under their feet shortly. Now, you can't bruise a spirit. Hello? <laughs> Satan is a spirit. He's a fallen angel. He's powerful. And we respect that. But it's the government, it's the way that the enemy uses and who he uses in people's lives that... Um, he gets a stronghold on. If he can get a dictator like Hitler to try annihilate the, the Jews and stop the fulfillment of the prophetic, he'll try. He's not done trying to stop the prophetic. That's why the Bible says for you to stir up the gift that was that is in you by the laying on of hands. When God has spoken a prophetic word to you to hold on to that word because God will fulfill that word. And the enemy is going to try to do everything and anything he can to prevent that from happening. His main mission is to destroy, to kill, and to take the promises of God and make them of, seem like they're none effect in your life to discourage you. You know, you can be saying, I'm praying and I'm praying and nothing seems to be happening. I'm praying and praying. Nothing seems to be happening. What's going on, God? And we talked about God giving me a word about barriers. God to remove the barriers, and we saw how God was starting to move. What happened to that? we got to continue praying that. God, remove the barriers in people's lives. Remove the barriers in my life that's keeping me from you. Remove the things that are tripping me up to from fulfilling the very things that you have in my life to fulfill. And believe me, the enemy is smart. He knows how to push the right buttons in your life to get you to react not respond, to react, and to get you away from his divine purpose, God's divine purpose. 
One of the things that I want to share with you is from uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Starting with verse 21. The Bible says to prove all things. Say it with me. Prove all things. I'll just prove some things. No. You prove all things. Prove all things. That's, in other words, you are, and I are to test even the good things that come in our life. Because sometimes things come into our life and they're not good. They seem good for the moment. But let me tell you this, every good and perfect gift comes from the Father above. And what else does it say? Do you know that scripture? And there's no, no what? No, no shower or turning with him? Someone, Bobby, find that scripture for me. That one just popped in my spirit. I don't have that in my notes or anything. I just, I just want to get that out there. Tell him so we can put it on the screen. Every good and perfect gift comes from the Father above. No. James one seventeen. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning God doesn't make mistakes okay so if God if you have if God gives you a gift of some kind in that particular gift takes you away from God it's not from God no matter how nice it is no matter how shiny it is or no matter who it is, if that person brings you closer or that thing or that gift or that whatever it may be, that whatever God gives you, it should bring a, a thankfulness and a gratefulness in your heart to God and bring you closer to God, not away from God. Some people, they say, okay, God bless me with a job. <clears throat> But then the job takes them away from church, takes them away from fellowship, takes them away from uh, interacting with the body of Christ. And they start working on Sundays. They can't come to church anymore because they got to work on Sunday. Is that a gift from God? No, it's not. How can it be a gift from God when the Holy Spirit says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, especially... As you see the day drawing nigh. What day? The coming of the Lord. As you start seeing the day coming closer and closer and closer to the coming of Jesus Christ, then he says, don't forsake. Hear me now. Don't forsake. What does that mean? What does it mean? Make sure you do it, right? 
Make sure, you, make sure you're assembling together as often as you can, especially as you see the day drawing nigh. The day of Jesus Christ's return, make sure that you don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. So how can God bless you with something that takes you away from him? This is why we have to understand this word. This is why we have to honor this word above our feelings and in our emotions. We have to honor this word for what God says. He says, prove, go back please if you will, to 1 Thessalonians 5, 21. He said, prove all things. Now, I remember years ago, we used to, um, we used to call it putting out a fleece. Remember that, Debbie? We used to put out a fleece, see if that was really of God or not. And I guess that's okay, but I believe that God wants us to really know his voice. How many believe that? How many believe God wants us to know his voice? Amen. God says, in, Jesus said it in his word, my sheep know my voice. Hello? God is not out to fool us. He's not out to trick us. He wants us to know his voice. He said, prove all things and hold fast to that which is good. Hold fast to that which is good. Prove all things and hold fast to that which is good. Prove all things and hold fast to that which is good. That means get a tight grip on it. Do you have the uh, amplified on that one? On that scripture, do you have the amplified version? It says, but test and prove all things until you can recognize what is good. So you prove and you test all things until you can recognize that whatever that is, is good. And to that, you hold fast. But we're living in a society today where that's getting more and more mod and blemished to know what is good and what is not good. And there's a reason for it. Isaiah prophesied this years, years, years before. And in chapter 5, I believe it is verse 20. I believe it's 520. Put that up there for me, please. Woe unto them that call evil good, and good evil. Now, when you see a word like woe there, that means in the Hebrew that God is saying to the person that does that, there will be judgment without mercy. That's what the woe is. It's not because he's riding a horse. Woe, no. He's saying that the, the people of that time are those who would say, and it's not somebody who says it verbally, but someone that believes. They just call good, evil good, and good evil. Now, I was on Facebook this past week. And I was saying that no true Christian should be celebrating Halloween. I got some flack for that.
There's nothing wrong with Halloween, they say. It's just a bunch of kids having a little bit of fun. You know, dressing up like their, their favorite, uh, 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 you know, adventure character and, and going from house to house and begging for candy. <laughs> nothing wrong with that. How many believe it's okay to go trick-or-treating and go Halloweening? Put your hand up if you believe it's okay. Nobody's putting their hand up. Well, maybe inside you think it's okay. But let me tell you something. Woe unto them that call e evil good and good evil. If you know the history behind Halloween, you know it's a high Satan ho ho holiday. It's a satanic holiday where they drink blood and they have sacrifices on that particular day, it's a holy high dark day. If you look at Halloween, what do you, what do you see? It's a celebration of the dead. Skeletons. Come on, somebody. Skeletons. Monsters. Ghosts. Departed spirits. And everybody in the neighborhood has at least one or two that are dressed up like witches. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil and put darkness for light and light for darkness. We've had people say that our country was not founded on Christian principles. We've had people say that Christianity and, and the Jews, were, we're the ones that are holding back everything from advancing forward to a one world government, one world church, and the whole nine yards. You got people saying that it's a woman's right to choose. Woe unto those who call evil good. Because they can't wait till they're married. So they have sexual relations and then they get pregnant. And then the woman and the man don't want to live up to the responsibility and the accountability of creating a person. Come on, somebody. And I get angry at that because I'm telling you, that's a person. It's not a fetus. It is a living person in that womb. But the world calls it good. A woman can choose what she wants to do with her body. That put darkness for light and light for darkness. Prove all things, hold fast to that which is what? Good. Hold fast to that which is good. Get a grip on it. Don't let it go. Don't let it slip. Come on, somebody. We gotta, we've got to start to speak for the things that are good. We've got to... We've got to say, Lord, this is right and this is wrong. And we've got to draw the line in the sand and say, you know what? We have to. We have to know what is good. And how do we do that? How do we know if something is good? How do we know that? Come on, I'm not up here preaching to the to the walls now. Huh? What did I just read? Prove all things. <coughs> Prove all things. Hold fast to that which is good once you recognize it. Don't let it slip. Don't let it go. Hold on to it. Because if you don't hold on to it, it's going to slip away. And I believe the reason why things are going the way they are is because the church has lost its grip on things. 
I believe that because the church has become a place where there's worldliness and sin and it's no longer dealt with anymore. We just want people in our church so we can have more money and bigger budgets and more things and we can look successful. And, and God says, no. God says, I don't care how big your church is. What I care about is the quality of what is being produced. I don't care if you have the reddest tomatoes in the world. They could be the reddest tomatoes in the world and be all rotten inside. God wants us to know as a church, he looks at the inner man. He looks at the heart of man. He doesn't go by what's on the outside. He goes by what is on the inside. So he said, prove all things, hold fast to that which is good. So he's telling us to get a hold of something, but he's also telling us to watch out for something. In verse 22, he said, abstain. From all appearance of evil. Put that in the Amplified for me, please. Abstain from evil. Shrink from it. Keep aloof from it. In whatever form or whatever kind... It may be. So it's not just an appearance of evil, but it's evil itself. When the enemy spoke to Eve, her mistake was getting into a dialogue with the serpent. Don't talk to the devil. Don't have a conversation with the devil. How many times you went to do something and the Holy Spirit in you said, don't do that. And then they, you heard a voice say, there's nothing wrong with that. You can do that. After all, the, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Anyone ever have that happen to them? Oh, yeah. You hear a voice that brings a reason or tries to convince you to just the opposite of what you were just previously convicted in your spirit about. The same way Eve was deceived, the enemy wants to deceive us. Calling evil good and good evil and putting light for darkness and darkness for light. It's changing everything and turning everything upside down from the reality of what things really are. In the early church, we have examples of in the early church, in the scriptures, of any type of fornication or any type of illicit sexual relationships that were going on in the church. Paul said to them, remove them from the church. Today we have churches filled with people committing fornication. Hello? You know why? Pastors won't deal with that because they don't want to lose this. See this money right here? They don't want to lose the tithe. They'll shut their mouths because they, they don't want to lose the money. They don't want to lose 
the money. They'd rather allow sin to take over in the congregation. He says a little leaven leavens the whole lump eventually. Come on. Even, even Paul said to the Corinthians, he said, Corinthians, he said, what's wrong with you that you have not brought judgment? See, because what happens is in the world we live in today, and I hear this quite often from people, when they're doing something wrong, hello? What do they say? Don't judge. Right? Hear it all the time now. Don't judge. Who are you to judge? Well, if I gotta prove all things, I gotta make a judgment. Hello? How many know that the Bible says we are to judge? You know that it does? Where does it say that? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to test your ability to remember. Corinthians, thank you. That's where it tells you. It says we're not to judge those that are without. That means the unbeliever. We're not to judge them. Okay? But we're to judge those that are within, Paul said. Oh, absolutely. We're to judge them. Not in a spirit of, of superiority like we're better than them. Like the Bible says, if you see a brother sin, you go to the brother or sister in the spirit of meekness and you restore the brother. But you've got to make a judgment. That's not happening. Yeah, but pastor, don't you know that scripture in Matthew? Judge not lest you be judged. Get that thrown at me lots of times. And I ask them this one simple question. Please explain to me the context. What's the context of that scripture? They can't tell me. They stumble. What do you mean? Just tell me the context. If you read the context there, Jesus is telling them, Judge not lest you be judged. He's talking to the, those that had the beam in their own eye, but trying to take the speck out of their brothers. They was talking about hypocrisy. That a person who is a hypocrite cannot judge because they're doing the same thing. That's what that scripture means. It doesn't mean that we're not to judge at all. And if that's the true, if that's true that we're not to judge at all, then there's a contradiction in God's word, and that's not God's word. There's no contradictions in God's word. That doesn't mean that you set yourself up as a judge and a jury of everything. I remember um, Dr. Ryan when he came, and we had some time of fellowship with the leadership. And he was telling us a story how he went into a church. He used to go into the churches and help churches that were really going through splits and difficulties. And this one uh, elder in the church board member said to Dr. Ryan, he says, uh, God's got me here to straighten out everybody and to make sure everything goes right. God's got me here to, to keep an eye on everybody. And Dr. Ryan said, well, who keeps an eye on you? Come on. Abstain means to Go away from. It comes with an idea of putting some distance between. To stay aloof. To shrink from it. You ever see anything shrink? It gets away from whatever's in there. It just shrinks away from it. To be at a distance from that which 
you are abstaining. Abstain. Keep away from the appearance of evil. How do you do that if you participate in Halloween? High Holy Day for Satanists. They have two of them. There's two. There's one in the, uh, like around the Easter time, and then there's this one. Two High Holy Days of Satanism. In fact, Anton LaVey, who was the, uh, he was the high priest for uh, the Satanic a church in California. He was the author of the Satanic Bible. He said this. He said, I am glad when Christians celebrate Halloween once a year. Imagine that. When your enemy of your soul is telling you he's glad when Christians celebrate Halloween. Abstain from even the appearance of evil. Walk away from, back away from that appearance. Stay away from that. From all appearance of evil. Draw away from it. Keep away from it. In whatever form... I love that definition in the Amplified. Because the King James says, abstain from the appearance of evil. But it leaves a vagueness to that. of Appearance. No. You stay away from evil. Stay away from what is evil. Oh, you don't know, no, Pastor. I love watching scary movies. No. Shrink from it. Keep aloof from it. Well, I don't want to deprive my child, you know. They'll cry and they'll rant and rave if they can't go trick-or-treating. So if they come to you and say, I want a shot of whiskey, you're going to give it to them? If they rant and rave, they want a shot of whiskey, you're going to give it to them? Come on, somebody. We got to call good, good and evil, evil. We got to take away that, that uh, middle line, if you will, of grayness. A lot of Christians live in gray. It's either black or white. It's either right or wrong. It's either good or evil. Come on, somebody. We need to stop watching some things on TV. Come on. Let me ask you this as Christians. How many would go, would go to a bar room and sit in the bar room at the bar? Huh? Come on. Where they're drinking and getting drunk. How many would do that? I don't see any hands up. But yet you'll put your TV on and you'll have a bar room right in your living room. Come on, somebody. Can I tell you that television has desensitized the American mind? Where we're, we will actually sit down for an hour, think about what I'm telling you now, and watch someone get murdered. Someone get killed, and we'll watch that as entertainment. Think about it, right? Watching a movie, bang, 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 guy gets shot, gets killed, gets all torn up, falls over dead. And we use that for entertainment. Don't tell me the devil hasn't lulled us to sleep. He's the one that's the murderer from the beginning. 
You don't think kids that are playing those video games for hours on time of killing and killing this one and killing that one, and then they grow up and they go out and get a gun and they go shoot up a mall or something like that? You don't think that had any effect on them? Because their little minds were all programmed, guess what, I'll just start the game tomorrow and that, that guy's going to get back up. There's no reality to the fantasy. He said, abstain from all appearance of evil. What appears evil? Come on, somebody. If you're going into a place, you better make sure you're prayed up. If you're going into a place... Make sure you listen to the voice of God. See, as a constable, sometimes I have to serve papers. I have to serve a divorce paper or I have to serve uh, a summons paper or I have to, I have to uh, implement an a, um, a, a, a eviction notice or I have to, uh, I have to implement a, a, a capious warrant on somebody and I have to arrest them. But I pray before I go. I bind any spirit of violence. I ask the Lord to be with me, to protect me. And so far, I've had no problems. I talked to people. I served a capious warrant today. I told the person, I said, you need to be in court next, next Friday, the 2nd. I believe November 2nd. And they were like, oh, yeah. I'll, I'll be there. That's because I don't want to come to your place of business and put you in cuffs and take you to the court. I don't want to do that. So just, you know, just come. Take care of this thing. Oh, gee, thank you. I appreciate it. But we have to know when you walk into a place that it's dangerous. I mean, sometimes you couldn't even go to the mall, even go down to the Galleria Mall and, and taught in that time when somebody went in there and started stabbing people. At Batucci's or whatever it was, or TGIF or whatever it was. Crazy people. We got to take responsibility. Abstain from the very presence of evil, what looks evil. Come on, somebody. Shrink from it. Keep it aloof from you. Don't go anywhere near it. How many know that when you obey God, there's a reward? One time a person said to me, Christians don't have fun. We all have fun. We have fun sometimes. We laugh so hard, we... Our bellies hurt. Come on. You can have fun, but good, clean fun. You know? I don't have to be in a place that I don't belong. Now, let me ask you this question. As a Christian now, Do you ever go someplace that you used to go and you just don't feel right? You know, you, you go to a place that maybe you were before you were a Christian. It just, just don't feel right. I remember, uh, this is a few months back, maybe during the summertime. I went to the uh, old six Bristol, it's now called Pub 60. 6T or something like that. I don't know, whatever it is. And I sat down and I ordered my food. I was with, I was with another constable and his wife. And uh, I looked over where the bandstand was. And that's where I used to set up my equipment, my music, and I used to play. 
A little tear came to my eye, and I said, God, thank you. Thank you that you took me out of this mess. You saved me and called me into the ministry. Thank you, God. I don't miss it for a single ounce. I don't miss it at all. I thank you, God. I thank you for taking me out of that miry clay and setting my feet up on the rock to stay. Hallelujah. God is good, isn't he? Well, what's going to happen if we abstain from all appearance of evil? What are we going to, what's going to happen to us if we shrink from it and keep aloof from it in whatever form or whatever kind it may be? What's going to happen to you and I? is found in the next verse. And the very God of peace sanctify you holy. Come on, somebody. God wants us to be obedient to the things that he says to be obedient about. If he says abstain from the appearance of evil, then you better abstain from it. Why? So you will be wholly sanctified. And he says, I pray to God, your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But it's going to take you and I, and by the way, that word abstain is in the present imperative in the Greek, which is a command to continuously, repeatedly abstain from. It's to continue. It's not a one-time thing. It's a continual thing. It's a continual thing to abstain from the very presence of evil. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. Sometimes I hear Christians say, oh, I don't see anything wrong with that. It's legal. Oh, I can have a drink. It's okay to drink alcohol. I can drink alcohol. Well, what's going to happen when they legalize marijuana for recreational purposes? <clears throat> Are you going to tell people it's okay to smoke, uh, smoke a joint because it's legal? What's the difference between that and alcohol? Come on. Getting quiet. What's the difference? Oh, uh, oh, 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 you know, uh, uh, it's all right, Pastor, because, you know, I think it's okay to have a couple of glasses of wine. You know, it's all right. Let me tell you something. I, I sat with people that were Christians that after they were done with one bottle, it wasn't enough. They had to have another bottle. And then they justify it by telling me it's part of their culture. You can justify it all you want to. Call evil good, good evil, whatever you want to do. Come on, somebody. Ain't nothing wrong with smoking cigarettes. I can smoke if I want to. Sure you can. And you can have cancer in your lips and your lips fall off too. Nothing wrong with that, Pastor. I can smoke cigarettes. There's nothing wrong with it. I ain't hurting anybody. Yes, you are. What does the Bible say? We should be well-rounded in everything. Everything in moderation. But I'm not talking about smoking marijuana, and I'm not talking about alcohol, and I'm not talking about that. Because your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. That's all right, Pastor. I can fill it full of smoke. You know what my grandma told me when I was young and I wanted to smoke? Because my grandmother smoked, you know? I still can see her with little fingers. You know, she had little fingers that pointed up like that and her little cigarette was in her hand, you know? And she said, now don't listen to, don't look at what I'm doing because I'm smoking. But she should say, if, if God meant us to smoke, he would have put a chimney on our head.
I remember being little, she used to tell me that. Isn't it true, though? But there ain't nothing wrong with that, Pastor. It's no big deal. Until you get cancer. And then you're coming down the aisle and you're crying because you're going to die of cancer. Come on, somebody. I know somebody like that. Why do we think it's not going to happen to us? Why do we think when we're disobedient to the things that God has convicted us of, that we're going to get away with it? What makes you think that way? You know what, what we call good evil? You know when we do that? When God says, do this, and we don't do it. When God says, I don't want you touching that, and we touch it anyway. That's what got Adam into trouble. That's what got Eve into trouble. Doing their own thing. Everybody's got to do their own thing. Well, guess what? You're not going to get sanctified in the process of God. You're not going to change. I don't want to be stuck. So many Christians are stuck. Five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. What's God doing in your life? Nothing. How have you changed? Don't know. Still stubborn? Rebellious? Come on, somebody. Abstain from all the appearance of evil. Sing that song, Yes, Lord. I'll say yes, Lord. I'll say yes. You want to be like that person? In the Bible? It says yes, but never does it. No. Abstain from what God says to abstain from. And the very peace of God will keep you. Amen. How many times you went to make a decision and God said no. And the moment you came into agreement with God, you had peace. But if you didn't come into agreement with God, you had no peace. Huh? How many of you ever made a decision and you thought it was God and you went and did whatever you did and then found out in the middle of what you were doing it wasn't God? Two honest people, me and Annie. Oh, I saw this. I saw. Uh, I saw her over here. Don't like, no want no one else to see. You know, just. And then verse 24, I'll close. Faithful is he that calleth you who will also do it. He'll also do it. See, the church philosophy today is if you want a large church and you want a lot of people in your church, what you have to do is assimilate like the world. Get rid of anything that looks Christian. Get rid of the cross. Get rid of the altar. Get rid of this. Get rid of uh, get rid of all of the uh, stuff. Get to get make it look like a nightclub. Now I can tell you because I was in the nightclub business. Paint it all black. Get your lights flashing. Get the smoke coming up. Start to appeal to entertaining the person. Because everybody loves entertainment. Amen. This country spends billions and billions of dollars every year on entertainment. They want to be entertained. So if you have a church that entertains people, you'll have a lot of people. 
But if you have somebody that will preach to you and tell you the truth and tell you what you need to hear rather than what they want to tell you to make you feel good. I can prove it from the scriptures. See, the, today's church wants the world to love them, to accept them. That's, that's the new church of today. They want the world to accept them and to love them. But Jesus said the world's going to hate you. Why is the world going to hate you? Why? Because men love darkness rather than light. You are the light of the world, Jesus said. And because that light, they're going to hate you for it. How many times, Debbie, you talk to somebody at work and they, they, they come at you? Who are you to judge? Come on. Who, who are you to judge? Who are you to judge me? Make you feel insignificant. I know God. God's in my life. And I say, what God is in your life? I'm a good person. That's not the kind of church I want. The kind of church I want is one that when I stand before God, God says, Pastor Bob, you know, my, can I tell, let me take that back because I didn't know Pastor Bob. My name's not written Pastor Bob in the book of life. We just say, Bob, I hope he says this. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in little things. Now be faithful in great things. And it doesn't matter if we have a thousand people. What matters is are we speaking the truth? It doesn't matter if, if, you know, we used to sing a song years ago. I don't know if you remember this. I have decided to follow you. I think we sang that. Didn't we sing that here? The cross before me, the world behind me. Though none go with me, still will I follow. Do you feel that way? Huh? I told my wife, I, I, I love my wife. I told her, I said, you have a backslide. Don't expect me to backslide with you. You're on your own. I'm same the other way too. You backslide, don't expect me to backslide with you because I'm, I'm not giving up my eternity for you. I love you, but you're not my eternal salvation. I'm not giving up heaven for you. and I'm not giving up heaven for anybody. Can I get a good amen? Amen. amen. I'll close now. I could go on and 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 on. Abstain from the very appearance of evil. But pastor, you don't understand. I only give out candy to the kids. Don't even let them get up to your door. In fact, you know what? I'm so glad. A couple of Halloweens came and we prayed and it rained like crazy. And this year it's on a Wednesday. So we'll all be in church. Hallelujah. Oh, God, help us. Help us not to call evil good, good evil. To exchange light for darkness and darkness for light. God, you said prove all things. Help us to do that. Help us to prove all things. Father, we thank you for tonight. We thank you, Father. Lord, we, we bind every spirit of evil that's unleashed on our community. Come on, pray with me. We bind every evil spirit, God. Every spirit of deception, Father, that's deceiving people, Father, taking them to hell. God, we come against the evil forces of darkness. We come against satanic witchcraft. 
in the name of Jesus. And we bind it in the name of Jesus. We plead the blood of Jesus Christ from the north to the south to the east and to the west of our city. And we say no more, no more, no more. Barriers be removed in the name of Jesus. Now, Father, as we go, keep us. Give us traveling mercies. And we'll not fail to give you the glory, the honor, and the praise. That's do your name. In Jesus' name, everyone said, God bless you tonight.